just like that's that's like lesson number one. Do you want to have a career? Show up on time. Right, right. Oh, I meant just <laughs> sense of time, like knowing how long. No, I don't. Say. Right. I yeah. Know. No, that's true. That's true. Uh, yeah. One time, one of my old, uh, one of the first uh, jobbing things I did way back, and and the band leader said, like, I think I'm going to open up a conservatory. It's going to be called a conservatory of time. Are you telling me something? <laughs> right. What, what's, your, what's, your, what's your original instrument? I know well, I, you were question. programming first. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really get into music until I was 18. So I started studying piano and voice. I'm not. Uh -huh. I'm not good at either of those. I can, I can, uh, I can do a mean Elvis impersonation, and that's about all I got at this point. So, that's good. <laughs> at least I, I should. I, I shouldn't say it because it. But I, I did see him when I was really, really young. Awesome. Yeah, in, in Vegas. Okay. okay, you got one minute of show time. All right. One more minute. How are we doing on right. bodies? Well, I, I think. Uh, this may be better I than microphone. 36. I see 36 participants. Yeah, Vijay, you're better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's good. Yeah, much better now. Much better. Very good. It's on the Zoom. In the Zoom setting, you need to select the microphone. That is true. Uh, yeah, it's not Zoom. It's not always well, the easiest. Easy easy and you said that. Uh, um, um, okay. Uh -oh. All right, so everybody here online, yes, so we're here at, we're at 6 o'clock Chicago time, so uh, welcome everyone uh, to our ACM Chicago um, October edition of uh, our webinar. So thank you very much uh, for all of you that are joining. Uh, we also would like to also thank as well, this is also being co-sponsored uh, with IEEE Computer Society of Chicago. So we thank uh, those members that are here tonight and also as well with uh, the Mid-America IT Tech. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is, uh, we had a little technical problem. Um, we're going to be getting ready our presentation soon. A little soon. bit different. Oh, there's Alvin. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So something that we have a little bit different that we've done um, in the past. Uh, so it's called uh, Software Musical Instrument Design with Machine Learning and Machine Listening. And we have uh, Professor Sam Pluta, who is the Assistant Professor of Music uh, from University of Chicago um, that will be speaking. Uh, but before we do that, uh, just a little bit about ACM Chicago. So for those people who don't know, so ACM is the Association for Computing Machinery. So it's a computer uh, professional organization. And we are the Chicago chapter of uh, ACM. And uh, we hold monthly meetings on topics that deal with uh, computing, like the ones here tonight. Uh, so I am the chair, um, so I'm Alvin Chin. Um, you can mail me at uh, chair at chicagoacm.org. Uh, my day job is working for BMW as a senior machine learning researcher. Uh, we have our vice chair, Mark Sempkin, um, who will be the one that will be introducing our speaker tonight. We have our treasurer, Greg Newmark. Um, our web is chicagoacm.org. And I'm sure a lot of you people here know about this meetup from our meetup page. Uh, we also on, on social media, so you can also follow us like us, um, connect with us on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and uh, LinkedIn. So these slides will be made available, so you don't have to worry about um, having to jot this down. Um, also as well, we'd like to present, also uh, welcome IEEE Computer Society, Chicago member too as well. So IEEE is kind of like a sister organization of ACM, kind of a similar to as well, but different organization. Um, so I am the chair of that organization as well. We have our vice chair, uh, Gina Martinez, and we do deal with topics that are very similar to um, ACM. So we've been doing, you know, during this COVID pandemic, we've been doing lots of joint uh, webinars uh, together that benefit both our organizations. And again, here is the, uh, the web, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, LinkedIn, uh, if you want to know more about us. And then I'm going to turn it to VJ. Um, who will be talking about the uh, Mid America IT Connect? So, VJ, uh, go ahead and. Uh, uh, thanks, Alvin. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, um, um, 
Mira Merak IT Connect is um, uh, thank you for um, the giving the opportunity to co-host this event, uh, Alvin, and um, along with the ACM Chicago and uh, IEEE. My name is Vijay Konkimala. I'm the founder of uh, the Mid America IT Connect. Mid America IT Connect was started about uh, three and a half years ago to share and collaborate on uh, cutting edge technology. And Mid America IT Connect is a private club in Chicago with beautiful panoramic views. I should definitely visit when you get a chance. And this is our, this event is our 36th presentation. And we are very excited to have Mr. Sam Pluta, who's the Assistant Professor of Music at uh, University of Chicago, to, gear, to hear the talk about uh, the software musical instrument uh, design, machine learning, and machine uh, uh, listening. Um, please welcome Mr. Sam Pluta. Over to you, Alvin. Okay, thank you. All right, so. Um Tonight's guest, Sam Pluta, is in the rare group of musicians who perform, compose, is an improviser, and on top of that is an instrument builder of software musical instruments. Sam has composed and performed with the top ensembles in contemporary music, including the Wet Ink Ensemble, the International Contemporary Ensemble, and had his works performed by the New York Philharmonic. At the ACM, we pick up presentation ideas anywhere. I first learned about Sam from the online sessions of the Grammy-nominated Spectral Quartet, a string quartet that performs works from 300 years ago to now, from Beethoven to Philip Glass. From that introduction, I listened to Sam's electroacoustic works and learned about his musical influences. Given that, I knew he would be a great presenter for the ACM. To get his unique view of software and musical instrument design with machine learning and machine listening, let's welcome our Chicago ACM guest, Sam Pluta. All right, then. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for that beautiful um, introduction. Okay, so Sam, the floor is yours. All right. Well, first of all, um, thank you all for ha having me, and a special thank to uh, Mark, Vijay, and Alvin, all the people in the ACM Chicago and IEEE. Um, so uh, there's a couple things there that uh, you know uh, Mark mentioned in his introduction that he saw me in this uh, spectral quartet presentation or talking with spectral quartet on a string quartet, which was completely acoustic piece, so totally um, written for. Uh, acoustic instruments. But what I'm going to talk about tonight is kind of not the opposite of that, because uh, that, that string quartet, which you should check out their, their new recording, is really fantastic. Um, uh, that that string quartet is a piece that I wrote for instruments that I'm trying to write down what I'm actually doing when I'm using my electronic instrument. So tonight we're going to talk about my electronic instrument. Um, there's a whole set of stuff that um, <laughs> that I'm I'm not going to probably get to about like how the whole instrument works, but I want to like focus in on um, elements of machine learning and machine listening that I've been ex exploring in the last uh, year or two years. Um, so I think the best way to start. Oh, and and just uh, you know just to say, uh, machine uh, learning and listening in in computer music has been happening for 20 years. Um, but in the last couple of years, and we see this in, in, in probably a lot of you are using m far more, um, far more uh, advanced uh, uh, technologies than I'm using. Um, but, but what we've seen is the, the ability to, to, to use this in a live setting. And I think that that's the thing that's super exciting is like using it in a live setting and getting into a feedback loop with the technology. And hopefully that's what I can get across tonight. So, um, I'm going to bring up a little video. So I'm going to start with a, um, so there's my, my talk. Um, hopefully you all can hear, hear this when I press play. And if you can't, then just stop me. But we tested it and you could hear it. We could hear it before. So, um, so this is just a video I made um, yesterday um, of me playing. And just notice that in the middle here, there is so I, I, iPad. On the left, there's an iPad. So two iPads and a joystick right here. And the joystick and this, uh, can you, can you um, hey Alvin, can you see my, um, my cursor or no? Um, I don't see your screen being shared. You don't see my screen being shared. Well, that's <laughs> good to know. Uh, yes, uh, sorry about that. Didn't press the button. Now do you see my screen being shared? Yes, we do, thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, now when you see this, can you see my cursor? No, probably not. Um, yes, we can. Oh, you can. Okay, great. So I have a joystick right here on the right, uh, just a, a 
traditional like uh, flight simulator joystick. And this joystick has an X, Y, and a yaw. So it goes left, right, and I'm sure there's a lot of gamers here, uh, uh, up, down, and then yaw, so it twists, twists to the left and twists to the right. So it gives three values. Um, and then right here, uh, and on this iPad, I have uh, two uh, pads, uh, two XY pads. So here we have XY and XY, so that has four values. So these are the two, um, the two uh, controllers that are controlling the neural networks, and um, and so the rest of the instrument is all this all this other stuff over here on the left iPad. But most of the neural network stuff is on the right iPad and in this joystick. So that's just to know what to look for um, t uh, for what what I'm doing. And I'll press play, and then I'll talk about it. Okay, so hopefully, um, hopefully you heard that. Hopefully you're still there. All I can see is my own screen. So um, the the what I'm going to talk about here is is the the instrument. One of the instruments that I'm I'm playing with the joystick, and then with the uh, X Y controller. So um, the 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 synthesis technique that I'm using in this is called cross feedback synthesis. Um, and on a Euro rack, if anyone's played around with the Euro racks, these are like so addictive and fun. And if you're into technology and music and you have money to dump into a uh, bucket that turns into uh, analog equipment, 
your Iraq is a great thing to, to pursue. Um, so th there's a technique called cross-synthesis feedback, which is super easy on the Eurorack. And what it is, is you have, you take uh, the output of one oscillator and you uh, plug that output into, I'm gonna go out of full screen here so that I can see my mouse. Um, you take the output of one oscillator, the triangle wave here, goes out into the input of the frequency modulation of this oscillator. Now, I'm gonna take the output of that oscillator right here and go into the frequency modulation of this oscillator. So the this oscillator is affecting this oscillator and this oscillator is affecting this oscillator. Essentially, we have a feedback situation and feedback can create all kinds of wonderful chaos and really, really easily uh, and, um, and cheaply, uh, like if you think of CPU, but uh, you get like really complicated sounds. So I'll show you that on my Euro rack right here. Um. So uh, why cross feedback? First of all, the sounds are super complex with the simplest possible circuit, right? Just like two, two wires uh, crossing. Uh, the results are super unpredictable. So even the tiniest change of values can result in enormous, so enormous sonic difference. And then a noisy, a noise can be like tiny, tiny motion in one of the oscillators ne away from total pitch. And those things are right next to each other. Um, results are non-linear. -lin sometimes higher frequencies mean higher sounds and sometimes they don't. So that non-linearity is something I, I really enjoy and I want to exploit uh, in digital synthesis. So it leaves us with a system that implies a more intuitive rather than a uh, methodical performance practice, right? Because you can't be methodical with something that is chaotic like this. Um, so here's the code for that in Super Collider. So I use this programming language called Super Collider. It is an object-oriented uh, language that was uh, written, the original version was written in 1997, I believe, uh, second version, 1998, and the third version, which is the current version uh, and is open source, uh, was released in about 2000 um, by James McCartney, who um, uh, ran the uh, core audio group at Apple for 20 years from after about 2000. So um, this is what the code looks like. Uh, the, the, the language itself is a scripted lang scripting language, but there's a, the synthesis engine is compiled. So if you find that interesting. Um, so this, this is the synthesis of that cross feedback. Um, <laughs> if I were to draw it out in, um, in a graph here, this is what it looks like. And so it's, there's a lot going on basically in this circuit. Um, there's more stuff I'll show you. There's more stuff going on than the simple cross feedback that I showed in the Euro rack. Um, and here's what it is. So um, I have, I don't know why that happens, but I lose my mouse at some point. So I have here, I have this noise. I can control the frequency of that noise. So the arrows are gonna be uh, parameters that I, I can control in the circuit and the boxes are the things that I am controlling. So I can control the frequency of this noise. I then have a resonant low pass filter. So a filter that cuts off the highs. I can control the frequency, the amplitude and the Q. So the resonance of the filter. Um, then I have a sine wave oscillator in which I'm sending a frequency and ampl amplitude. I, and I have a triangle wave oscillator that I'm sending the frequency. To get the cross feedback, I'm feeding the sine wave oscillator into the uh, triangle wave, and then I'm sending the triangle wave back, feeding back into the sine wave oscillator. So that's your, that's your cross feedback circuit. So this is the thing that makes sound in the circuit, and then there's more to it. So that output comes out here. Uh, it, I can distort the signal. Um, I can control how much I'm distorting the signal uh, as an as a, uh, argument. Um, and then, uh, and then there's like this dusty on-off thing that can kind of, t uh, it's basically turning the, the signal on and off with amplitude modulation. Uh, I can tr control the uh, attack release of that and the speed of it. And then that goes out to another resonant low pass filter. Um, and that resonant low pass filter, uh, I am a controlling with another, <laughs> uh, filter. So you can see that there's, here's the whole circuit. You can see the whole circuit is it's not like the most comp complex thing in the world, but there's a lot of controls. Basically, I can control, um, I think it's 16 different parameters um, to change the sound of the circuit. Um, now, as a human, controlling 16 parameters at once is actually really hard. 
right? And and we can't really not even if we could control them, it's it's difficult for us to um, to uh, process that much information. But I can actually easily process the information of three or four parameters, right? So this is why I'm using the neural networks, is um, that I have a joystick, which has X, Y, Z, or I have these two um, X, X, Y pads, so I have X, Y, X, Y, so three or four d uh, dimensional space that I'm using the neural network to expand out to a 16 or n dimensional space. And you'll see when I show it later that I have some s synthesis algorithms that, that are much uh, higher dimensionality. So. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Um, I'm using, um, so I have four inputs uh, in this case, and I'm using three hidden layers uh, going out to 16 outputs. Um, I'm using a native, I started working in Keras uh, TensorFlow when I was designing this, um, and then in the meantime, a group in at the University of Huddersfield in the UK developed native um, uh, MLPs in uh, in Super Collider and Max and and um, yeah Super Collider and Max it's called Flucoma so uh, you can check that out they're 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 doing really great work bringing all this stuff to these native uh, computer music languages um, so that in and of itself using the, the the neural net like that is not the most interesting thing in the world I think the interface is kind of everything though. And uh, I think that's where things get get interesting. So um, each, actually, let me just show you um, show you the software. Can you see this software now? Super Collider. Um, uh, yes, we can. Okay, great. So uh, here's the here's the uh, neural net software, uh, or the the I call them my neural net synths. And uh, what I have that I think is interesting is that, so here I'm, I have, um, I'll just show you, I have one synthesis, one synthesis, synth synthesis engine. <coughs> you, play it. you can hear, the, hear those squeaky squawk sounds? Yes. Great, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, <coughs> so as you can see, here is that, here is the, all, all the parameters of that synth, and that's the one I was just showing you. Um, 16 parameters. Uh, all of which are going to move in different directions. What I'm using to control it over here are, f are four parameters, um, x, y, and x, y. And so when I move, when I move the, x, the x, y faders around, you can see that these faders move around over here. So um, what's uh, super cool about that is that, uh, or, or, or what I think is um, really, um, effective musically is that I can I can use my controller to actually control eight different mappings of each synth so I could be it could be more than that but you know I chose to be finite in my choice so so I have a synth and here's one mapping <coughs> right and now here's another one and here's another one Right, so those are three, they're all the same synth, and you can see over here that it was moving around all these faders. Now I have that really uh, asynchronous because I, it's, it's moving graphics can really hog CPU and my computer was getting old. Um, but but you can, those are three um, totally uh, different mappings, but the same synth, so all the same, the same um, set, all the same, um, uni, uni, um, sorry, synth def in Super Collider. So, in any one synth in this um, in this setup, I have eight different mappings of my of my neural network, which I can train. Let me just show you this. Um, I'm going to just load these. Uh, let me turn it on. Uh, let's go to this one. Nice and noisy. But if I load the points and One, two, three, four, five, six. So it's really, um, it's really just six points um, on the on the x on the on the two x y uh, multi ball controllers that are controlling that mapping. Uh, but it's it's uh, s super expressive because I can find this like little area to play around with. 
So hopefully that makes sense. So so each of these synthesis uh, synthesizers has eight different mappings. The cool thing is it's not just one synthesizer, it's actually four synthesizers or as many of these, um, these as I want to make. So here's another synthesizer called the noise one. And those are the eight mappings of the noise one. Um, here's one, which I think things get interesting. This one's, uh, has way more uh, parameters to control. Um, this is actually, if you're a, a synth nerd, this one uses a model of a uh, DX7, um, which I don't know how they made uh, the music they made with the DX7, the, the, synth the synthesis model, because it's totally bonkers. Um, but, and, and y you'll hear that here. <laughs> So it's a really weird sounding um, model. Uh, there's tons of feedback going on, but I'm controlling so many more parameters with that that um, with that that synth there. And just to show that there's one more. Right. So there's four different synths, um, each with eight different mappings. So yeah. So one controller can control eight mappings, and then um, yeah. So. Yeah, with 16 different controllable parameters, there are infinite sounds. So this is, thinking about a mapping, uh, there's, with 16 controllable parameters, there are infinite sounds within the universe of the synth. Um, it's a 16-dimensional space, so even if the each dimension only has 100 points, which it doesn't, it has more than that, we have 10 to the 32, uh, you know, 1 trillion to the third uh, different points within that space. So you have to use the, the in order to, to map that, that area, uh, the neural net's a great way to do it because I can't personally um, visualize that kind of space at all. Um, so there's, I within each of these synths, because they're actually so chaotic, there's these like glorious little sonic little places and it's, and it's training the network is training to find these little beautiful little sonic gems that I, lo I love. Um, and yeah, the obvious solution then is to find multiple mappings and, and that I really like and then to be able to quickly and easily access those mappings, which I showed you a second ago. Um, so the software can load four different neural, s neural net synths and each one with its own new gen and set of n parameters. Uh, and within each uh, neural net synth, there are 32 possible different mappings of up to four different synths. So there's just so many different, so many different things you can access, so much data that you can access. And I think the goal of any good instrument, think about a violin, is to not just have a lot of data that you can access, that, but to be able to access that data uh, within a tiny, um, tiny space to that, uh, of, of movement. And yeah, so here's what I was hopefully showing in the software is that four simultaneous instrument mappings with eight each, I can quickly move around this space just by, just by moving the joystick or moving the, um, moving the two X, X, Y pads. Um, great. So, right. So here's some stuff that I think is hopefully interesting to you guys. Um, feedback systems and neural networks, networks, <laughs> secret lovers. <laughs> so, so what is it, what is it that we like about feedback systems? So, if you're into music and you're into like no input mixers or or audio feedback, um, or or if you're a programmer, and you're into feedback systems. Um, they can be really unpredictable and nonlinear. They can have like super simple parameters, but have complex outputs. They create this cybernetic feedback system with human users that breeds like this endless play and creativity. So it creates a, a setup that doesn't really give the same answer every time. It's something that you're really interested in and you want to like keep exploring. What do we like about neural nets? Uh, or what do I like about them? <laughs> the outputs of the mappings can be nonlinear, resulting in un unpredictable sounds. Now, I'm sure you're, many of you are using them for other reasons, but um, they can be used to map simple parameters onto complex output uh, with a sufficiently complex system. And by in, uh, intuitive, supervised uh, training rather than direct mapping, they create this cybernetic feedback system where human users can breed endless play and creativity. So these things are really uh, complement one another in how they think. Um, and I, I think that that's why I was drawn to this design. 
Um, and did I mention cybernetic feedback systems? So uh, one approach to creating expressive instruments using deep learning is to create a training system that is itself a cybernetic loop. So in this case, I want to be able to rapidly train my system. So I want to be able to like find the points that I like, train it, and test it. See if I want, see if I like it. Um, reload the points, um, tweak one of them, take it out, put it, put a new point in, see if that totally changes the result. And so instead of having like a um, you know, a training set where there's like a million points and that's how we're training our network. It's more like a small number of points, just getting them right and then entering the network there. <coughs> um, yeah, and, and uh, by creating a setup also in the software design, I can train the network and create the synthesis algorithm at the same time. So they just become this like this feedback loop between um, the training and the system um, a kind of further feedback loop. Um, and so I think this is really important in musical instrument design, and I'm sure it's really important in, in any kind of um, uh, commercial design. So having feedback level, uh, feedback at all levels of the training. So me as a human, as a performer, um, I want to be putting information into my audio instrument. My audio instrument itself should have kind of feedback inside of it. Um, and then I want to be getting the, the, f the sound back to me um, and then hearing what's going on and then, um, and then sending it back into the instrument and retraining. So, um, yeah, here's uh, some <laughs> completely unscientific thoughts. Uh, and this is just choice of controllers. So, so I could I could use like a I could use a slider, or I could use like just one X Y pad. But I actually choose to use the three and four dimensional controllers, and um, because um, I'm performing in this space, the sonic space that I'm I'm performing on, or the the instrument that I'm performing on is this multi dimensional space, and um, I can perform in that space, and I can hear the differences, but I cannot visualize that space in my mind. Um, that's I similar have the same same feeling with the four dimensions of the um, of the two X Y pads. Like I can't I don't really I can kind of feel the where where the sounds are, but like I don't I don't I can't actually understand it. And I think that's actually a good thing in this case um, because the 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 number of combinations of up down left right it just it it kind of boggles the mind. So that I'm actually performing in an, in within an intuitive space. Um, and it's not, I'm not thinking like, oh, the, the X value, so if I'm moving the slider from left to right, then it's, that's the frequency. And, I'm, and up and down, well, that's going to control the um, speed of the modulator. I'm not thinking that at all. I'm just hearing the sound, moving my fingers, and, and intuitively moving around the space. Um, and that, that brings up a bigger question is, uh, like, as humans, and I'd love if anyone is a specialist on this, like, is, is sound our way of visualizing multidimensional spaces? Because uh, we're able to hear all these, all these different parameters changing, and we can hear all, we can hear all that stuff, um, but, you know, we can't, s we can't visualize it uh, with our, our visual minds, but, but hearing it is actually no problem. Um, so that's the end of that. And I, I have another, like, another part of the presentation, but I think that, that I should maybe stop here and, and get some questions. And then, uh, you know, if there's time for the other thing, great. If there's not, then that's fine, too. Okay, great. So, Mark, I think we have some questions. Maybe you can uh, take over. Right. Um, oh, you got, you, you opened me up. Okay, great. All right. One moment. All right. We have a number of questions there. So this is from Jordan. I was wondering if you work with hardware equipment and software which produces tones with a well-defined pitch, basically something which is based on the harmonic sequence in some way. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, so yeah, that's um, uh, I have in the, with this instrument. I'm kind of engaging uh, super noisy stuff, but uh, I use pitches all the time. I love I love beautiful harmonies. Um, but I do think that they engage with, with maybe different psychologies and, um, you know, p pitches and, and the way harmonies move, um, that might, uh, deal with a certain kind of like th kind of traditional emotional space. Uh, whereas I would say these kinds of noisy sounds, um, 
uh, more deals with a, uh, a brain space of um, like a focus, a focus and awareness, like a more of a more of a meditative space. Even though it probably doesn't sound meditative, but that for me it is. So <laughs> yeah, but I yeah I love I love those sounds, of course. Alexander wants to know: Have you experimented with other hardware peripherals? The joystick is intuitively valuable. Are there any others that work well too? Yeah. So um, for years, I used a controller. I mean, I love I love the iPad, uh, just because it can be super. You can have like so many parameters, and then you can change you can change the the visual, uh, which I think is very useful. Um, for years, I used a controller called a, um, a Snyder Phonics Monta. I'll type that in the um, I'll type it in the uh, chat. Am I? Uh, yeah, panelists and attendees. So Snyder Phonics Monta. This thing is awesome. Um, and it's uh, it's a uh, it's like a, a square controller with a bunch of of uh, uh, capacitance based uh, buttons, but they're not buttons; they're capacitance. So it's how much of your finger is pressing them. Um, and I used that for a long time. I, unfortunately, I developed a um, an autoimmune condition um, where I'm actually allergic to to gold, <laughs> and uh, it which is unrelated to the Snyder Phonics Monta, but it was made of gold and it was actually uh, causing um, flare-ups of my autoimmune condition. Um, so I've used that. I'm into anything, I'm into any controller. So the, I've, I've also, so this software, um, let me just I'll share the screen again for a second. The, um, the if I go here, so the, the, the input could be, can be basically anything. So it doesn't like I've just given it four parameters, but like I can <coughs> plug in my joystick and map that, and then I. But one of the other things I've been using, uh, or I used with this, was is a. Um, um, oh, why can't I think of the name of it? It's because I'm in front of other people. Um, it, it's the the uh, the like hand sensor. What is that called? Theremin. No, but uh, but it's just uh, like a, a hand sensor that uh, that gives you many many dimensions, and I think that yeah, leap leap mo leap motion. Thank you, um, and that uh, that w that worked. Uh, thanks, Ali. <laughs> that worked. Uh, uh, that works really well. And I use it. So that one I used to use the leap motion to control feedback. I have these televisions where I put like six microphones on the televisions. This is the biggest network I had. So it's the leap motion in I don't know how many parameters I was using uh, probably four and then and then um, and then controlling uh, 56 uh, dimensions of this like feedback going into a television so that, that's like a really fun um, use of multiple multiple kind of controllers but I I, I, I I use joysticks I use I have Nintendo switch controllers which I've played around with a bit I think in the end, we only have sliders and knobs. That's all we have, and so and buttons, and so any any kind of combination of those, I'm 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 down. Next question is from Jeff Solon. He asks, if you're playing around with the instrument and you stumble across an accidental sound that you love, can you review back through the record to determine what was happening at that point so you can capture and recreate it as assigned to a button? Right. Um, Yes and no. So it's not uh, the way I've set up the software doesn't really do that. It doesn't really assign it to a button. It's more like assigning a process to a button. So and the process itself is is kind of a cha is is chaotic. So it's so the so the sound the sound is going through like many different modules that are that are changing it. Right. So the sound comes in, maybe it'll get uh, filtered and then it gets delayed and then it, I can loop it into a buffer. But like all of those things would have to line up perfectly for me to perfectly replicate a sound. Um, but what I'll say is one of my favorite things about playing with somebody new is that uh, when we sit down, all of a sudden their world and my world, we're so we start communicating, right? We're communicating. and. They will probably do something if I haven't played with them. They'll probably do something that I've never encountered. And what'll happen is, almost quickly, almost within five minutes of starting playing, we will create a space that we make music in, and that that space can often be a totally new space. And what that does is that allows me, when I'm playing, I'll find when I'm playing with somebody new, especially like first time playing. It's like I should play with new people all the time because. The first time, like, they'll do something, and I'll find something in my software that I didn't know before. 
right? So a totally new space that uh, I had no idea existed within the software. And, um, and then from that point on, I, I have that space um, for, <laughs> for the rest of, of my life. That was my wife walking by. Um, so so that, uh, that's a super uh, exciting thing is like finding a new space within the software. But that's a whole, that's a whole like, I can't really explain. It's not like a button. It's more like, it's more like a set of a settings that I can f get to. We have uh, two more questions in the queue right now, sure. and we'll hopefully get some more uh, yeah. later, as yeah. you like. Uh, this one's from Terry. I find most super colliders since compositions, et cetera, works get lost in technology and programming versus musicality. How do you personally overcome this? Oh, man, I know exactly what you mean. So, um, and I, I, hope, I hope I overcome it. Uh, that's the, what we can try to do. I think there, there's a balance in in music technology because the 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 goal you know we all we, uh, probably most of the people here are find technology beautiful right technology and technology is beautiful i remember the first time i saw a piece where i saw the code and a piece of music where i saw the code and i was like oh my god this piece is so beautiful and i hadn't even listened to it right yet right so that can be super that we can we all can probably find attractive and beautiful and we're all attracted to that otherwise we probably wouldn't be here <laughs> but um but then there's the sonic side right and so we want to make something that is musically beautiful as well and so it's really just playing a balancing act between those two things and oftentimes if if things start to get too complicated you're probably doing it wrong especially with music because i mean i'm making something right now and i'll tell you i know it's wrong i know it's wrong but I can't, I have to make it to show myself that it's wrong. And I know it's wrong because it's not going to be musically rewarding. And then I'll probably work on it for like literally a month and then I'll throw it out. So I think that that's, but that's okay. That's okay. Like we have to be able to uh, uh, experiment and play around because that, that the thing that I'm wor working on is, is technically beautiful. And so then, but then I have to double check with the musically beautiful. And if it's not, then, then it's not, it's, it's not worth it. What's beautiful about, or what's exciting about making an instrument like this, I've been, I've been working on this instrument, not the neural net stuff, that's just the last year, but I've been working on the larger instrument for, um, for like 15, 10, 15 years, right? So, or 12, 12 years, I think. And so it's 12 years of code and 12 years of good ideas and 12 years of bad ideas. And the, the good ideas stay and the bad ideas go. And here's the last question for now. This is from John Gibson. Uh, if I'm hey, John. memory correct from Indiana University School of Music. Yeah. I went there. <laughs> Sam, I may have missed this, but can you say more about how you are training your system in Super Collider? Is it happening in advance of a performance or during a performance? Uh, no, that's a good question. I, I, I do the training ahead of time. Um, and I kind of like, you know, it's, it's a tricky, it's a tricky balance because the, um, the, um, the what was I saying? Sorry, I did, the uh, the sy the synth now has like so many uh, available possibilities that I also need to be sure to not keep retraining it, so I kind of know what it's gonna do. Um, so like once I find a training I like, I I keep it and 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 they're stored. Now I'm working on something right now that uh, basically takes it's kind of like a live. Um, uh, using using these machine listening and machine learning stuff to create almost like a ring modulator. So it, it, it's going to be so much work and I'm just going to end up with a ring modulator, which is like literally like two, two uh, diodes. Um, but but what it does is it, it, it takes signal in from a player and then it listens to their signal over the last um, could, like three seconds and 10 seconds and then or three seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds, right? Creates uh, three different uh, mappings that I can then move between. And it takes takes their signal and basically turns their that space that they created in the last se three seconds, it turns that into um, an XY space. It actually, so it takes, since there's probably some technical people here, it takes that the what they're doing, uh, analyzes it, and then plots it using a PCA um, graph so to 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 bring it down to two dimen two dimensions <coughs> then it, so that creates a two-dimensional space 
for them. And so then they're playing, and, and now the points that they're making that I'm analyzing are then moving around the two-dimensional space. Well, what is that? That's a joystick, right? So it basically turns their signal into an XY joystick using a PCA, and then, um, and then uses that to control uh, a synth. So that's a, something where I'm doing the mapping in, in real time, but, but this stuff I'm not. Um, was there one more, or should I keep going? Well, we, we have uh, we have lots of questions, so uh, you you know let us know what you want to do. I, I mean, I'm glad to answer these questions. Um, the other thing could be really short, so. Okay. Um, there's a question from uh, from Mark. Any use of any type of tempo in your performances? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I have, um, I, I can definitely play with, with somebody who's, uh, so mo most of the time I'm not playing solo, right? I actually play with other musicians. Um, and I play in some jazz bands and I play, you know, there's drummers and people are playing in tempo. Now I am almost never, I'm, I'm, I tend to be this uh, kind of, sound mass element in those or in a f something moving between effect and orchestration right so uh, a string section or something it's this whole other it's all like another rhythm section um, but it's not a rhythm section that is keeping time um, now that is a just a choice i've made over the years um I, i'm not i'm not stuck in that and i'm, I'm glad to um Glad to do something else sometimes and, 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 and try new things. I, I, think, I think the instrument, the, the issue with tempo, one of the things is I'm not great like as a counter. Uh, so like you would have to be like really triggering things in time. Um, and then, but then the other thing is the instrument, if you're doing processing of sound of somebody else's signal, it's always gonna be delayed, right? So the signal is gonna come in. Even if, you, even if the signal comes in and it goes straight out, it's delayed because that's, that's the nature of the instrument. That is actually the foundation of the instrument. That's all the instrument can do is make a delay. So basically the instrument comes in, or the, s the sound comes in, and then something happens, and then it comes out. So there's always a delay, which makes it very hard to stay in time with people, because then you're always a little behind. There's always a lag. Here's another question from Nathan. Could you yeah. say a little bit more about how you're training your model? You seem yeah. to be implying you have found a quicker, more interactive method as opposed to training off of a large quantity of labeled data at once. Yeah, so the, the trainings are not, um, they're just not, let me, I'm gonna share my screen again here. Um, it's just not many, um, just not many points is the thing. So it, it what I think is, so if I, so, Actually, let's go. It's been a lot of <coughs> noisy stuff. So, if I do this one, there's some rhythm. Um, okay. So, if I, I'm going to load the points that I used to train this. So that's one point. Two points. Three points. Four points. Four points. So the whole thing is four points. And it's it's the, the four points you can see are here and here. So when I when I press when I show load the points, it'll it'll show you where the, the XY pods are and it'll show you where where this is. And all I'm doing So all I'm doing is I find a sound. I move these sliders around until I find a sound that I like, and I go, ah, that's my point. And then I move the I move the X Y pads to the point where I th the lower left corner, or both of them to the lower left, or one to the lower left, one to the lower right, or you know any combination. And I just say, add point. And then I then I move all these, find a new sound that I think is related in a way, or not. Uh, Okay, add point, move these, add point, move these, add point. So there's not many points, there's just four, I think the most I use like eight. So there's just, and, and, and here's the thing, that, that I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, that's not gonna be very accurate. Exactly, it's not accurate at all. And, it's, and that's fine because it's, um, 
it's music and uh music actually uh is best without right answers like it's at least at least uh, i found that this instrument is best when it doesn't make right answers it's actually best when it's a random number generator so um hopefully that hopefully that answers your question okay lee wants to know can you talk about how flu coma is interacting with your instrument yeah so flu coma is the is the uh machine learning um is the is the network the neural network so uh let me uh share again and so i will show you the code for this um i should have had that open open uh, so these are, so actually this is kind of interesting is like these are the synths that I've made um, and each one the directory structure kind of stores so these are different mappings that I've made so um, and and it's stored in these uh, JSON files um, so if I open let's see the and then synth module mod yeah so this one uh yeah so fluid mlp regressor is the object and i make eight of them and it's that's the that's the uh instead of using keras it or or uh, tensorflow or what it, pick your pick your poison um that's that's the the object so i'm not sure those are publicly available yet so if if you've used it because the the their their listening stuff is available but i'm not sure if the um the machine learning stuff is available yet um here's two more questions uh yeah. uh alexander again in working with your neural networks do you face the black box problem is it important to you to know how to interpret what the neural network's learning, perhaps with decision trees. No, it's 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 actually best that I don't. And this is actually why I love it. It's I love it because um, because it completely removes that from my thought process and allows me to be musical uh, with the like like you know these four things are controlling these whatever 50 things and i i can't possibly like think about the decision tree there but i can th i can hear exactly whether i like it or not so it's really just using my ears and that's why i thought thought it was awesome by the way i i'll just say that that that, that uh there's like three people to thank for getting into this stuff one is rebecca, rebecca Feebrink, and so she, i don't know if anyone's used the weckinator but she's been doing this for 10 years uh and sh and she's a real innovator in the field um, and I saw her give a talk about this, and I said, because I hadn't, I hadn't seen, you know, people have been using these, these neural networks and music for a long time, but, but seeing them used in a live setting was just like, oh, I, I know what to do with that. And it's, and, it's be, and it's to answer your question, it's like, I know what to do with it because I knew that I could do something where I didn't have to know exactly what was going on. I also do like knowing what's going on, but, but kind of creating these, these um, like why I love an analog synth. I, I, I know what I'm doing step by step, but then in the end, you're like, how did I make this thing? And that's an awesome place to be sonically. Um, and then, and then uh, my grad students, so Ted Moore and uh, Hunter uh, Brown, who are doing great, just great stuff uh, with, with machine learning and, and seeing them do it. And it's like, oh, okay, I, I can make music with this. We've got a question from uh, Bill. Um, I bring that back up here. So, um, where were the synths and neural network actually running? Were they on the iPad or somewhere else? Right. So, they, so the, the software all runs on my computer. Um, it's uh, basically I'm using the iPad just as a controller, and I'm using the joystick just as a controller, and the 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 synths run on my computer. Now, that's a whole other that's a whole other can of worms. Basically. Um, Anyone who deals with the audio or deals with uh, uh, audio is, has a hard time dealing with um, multiprocessor systems, and it has a hard time because, like, it has to be super in line. I, say, I don't really know the answer to this, but this is my understanding. It has to be super in line, and 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 and. Multi
multiprocessor systems, uh, if you try to line up audio and get them all like sample accurate and they're running over multiple processors, well, a lot of your processing is going to be dealt deal with lining it up. So it's, it's actually very hard to deal with uh, that uh, that computational problem. Um, so I've got actually like 10 server, 10 different audio servers running on my computer, which then are fed back in, into the computer and, and, and run in parallel. So, so there's a lot of computing going on, but it wouldn't, I don't think it would run on an iPad. Um, also super is in a weird, has a weird, um, uh, license, uh, where I, I don't think you can actually port it to iPad legally. Okay, uh, Jason wants to know, I totally get why you moved away from Keras. Keras? But yep. let's say that I had an awesome and fast audio generation model trained in TensorFlow save model format. Would it be possible to use it in a super collider based system? What steps would someone take to make that happen? Um, I'm not sure if he means control or audio. Uh, it doesn't say. Um, so, so if if it's an audio system in TensorFlow, or or you're you're doing some kind of synthesis or something, that's that would be um, that would probably be really easy. So the way I was communicating with with Keras before with it was with Python, um, is just Open Sound Control. So Open Sound Control is really awesome. Um, uh, uh, it's like MIDI. It sends data between. Uh, programs. It was from 1998. There's some limitations to it, like you can't send strings or something like that. But but you can you can send like data. So I was basically sending the controller data over to Python, and then Python was sending the uh, the so I was sending the four controller data over to Python, and the Python was sell, send the end controller back. Um, and so that works really well. So if you're just doing data, then then it's it's actually super easy. It's actually super efficient. Um, in some ways, it's a little better than than using it locally because the um, uh, yeah the the um, th then the Python is running on its own thread, right? So so then then it's not you don't have to deal that 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 processing can happen on its own. So I found that that aspect of it, I never really had an issue with um, with any kind of um, processing stuff. Whereas in with the local super collider stuff, since it's running on the server, then if there's too much audio going on, it can get a little funky. So, um, so yeah, uh, the other way to do it is, is you know, if, 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 if you're like doing a synthesis engine or something in Python and you want the audio to come back to the super collider, I, I, th I guess you could send the audio over the network. Um, and if you're doing it in like C, then maybe you could compile it to a, a unit generator in, um, or C++ in super collider, which the, the, Super Collider API allows you to create your own unit generators. So um, if you're programming in C++, you could probably do that. OK, here's our last question. That's from Jeff Solon, who I want to mention is one of the teachers of our next month's speaker. Uh, not really a question. This is going to sound a little nutty. But as someone into music, computer science, and speed cubing, Rubik's Cubes, I'd love to see what would happen if you use something like a GAN 356i smart cube. Uh, it knows every rotation and orientation of the cube as an additional controller. It uses gyros, accelerators, and Bluetooth. Seems yeah. like you could have a lot of fun experimenting with many types and methods of control. Oh, absolutely. I mean, so 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 you said there's like an accelerometer, there's gyros. You, it knows where it is. I mean, that's so, that's so. Uh, that, I mean, you could also like, if you could train. So if you can use that as a controller to like a a, fit, a model that is making certain sounds. And, and, and say that say the sounds line up to uh, to specific locations within the the cube. Um, you know that that could be a really fun way. Uh, now that would be an amazing way for uh, people with uh, sight disability to uh, learn Rubik's cubes uh, because you basically have sonified the data environment of the Rubik's cube. It would be a lot of points. <laughs> that's the only issue because that's a, how many possibilities are there in a Rubik's cube? My goodness, um, and uh, and uh, and it would it would create this like audio visual experience uh, of watching somebody um, control the cube or fix uh, solve the cube, um, and I think that would that would be super cool. That would be super cool. Kind of a inter intermediate relationship between cube and cube and sound. 
Okay, great. That wraps it up for the questions, and we're going to proceed with the rest of the uh, presentation and the closing. Okay, so, well, yeah, thank you uh, very much, uh, Sam, for um, that wonderful uh, performance that you've shown and also for explaining um, how you go ahead and, and do that. And thank you all for the, uh, the questions thank you that, guys. that everybody posted. And thank you so, guys. Was, um, those are great questions. Yeah. 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 So, so um, before we end, uh, we have our next uh, ACM Chicago webinar, also on, on the same lines of uh, artistic uh, theme. So I'll play a little bit of what we have for, um, in November. Oh, first of all, I need to share my screen. Our next program on November 18th, 2020, is Cinematic Scientific Visualization, where science meets Hollywood visual effects. Our speaker, Kalina Borkiewicz, is a senior research programmer for the Advanced Visualization Lab at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her computer graphics Graphic software and tools convert extremely large scientific data sets into high fidelity, production quality, IMAX screen ready visuals for documentaries which have been seen at the Adler Planetarium, IMAX theaters, Hulu, and Amazon Prime. She will talk about how scientific visualization serves a vital role in educating the public by cutting through the noise with meaningful, scientifically validated imagery with high quality visualizations. Her presentation will explore how scientists, film producers, and education experts work with astronomers, geologists, biologists, and others to create virtual tours of scientific domains for high resolution immersive screens, which help audiences build a foundational understanding about complex science concepts. Okay, great. So yeah, we have a great uh, presentation uh, for next uh, month. And uh, if you go to our ACM Chicago meetup, uh, you will find that the page, uh, the event is available there. So you can start registering. I already saw several people already tonight register for that. So um, yeah, so there was a question regarding about for PDH, uh, professional development hours. Uh, yes, so there will be a certificate that will be sent out, including a copy of the recording um, and uh, slides from, from Sam or so. And, uh, we can send those out and then you can put your name in if you need to have a uh, professional development um, hour uh, certificate. And I'm just going to do a launch a quick poll here. So we want to know, we want to get feedback from you, our attendees, right? To see, you know, whether uh, these particular webinars, were they relevant for you um, in terms of how we'll how do with the quality and what are some particular possible uh, topics um, that you would like to um, you would like to see so we can be able to cater um, to our, our members. Okay, so I'll leave this uh, polling up. And uh, yes, thank you everyone for attending this evening. We had a really great uh, response. I think we had about, I saw almost approaching 80 attendees. So that's very, very good, especially for uh, in the evening. <laughs> you know, we're now seven o'clock in Chicago. So thank you for, for staying up uh, with us. And uh, uh, so thank you, ACM Chicago. Thank you, IEEE Computer Society Chicago members. And thank you, Mid-America Club members uh, for coming uh, this evening. So that wraps up for tonight. Uh, thank you again, Sam, again. And uh, thank, you, Sam. thank you, guys. We'll see you in our next, um, next talk in uh, November the 18th. Thank Thanks you, Alvin. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Sam. Bye-bye. Okay, then, bye-bye. Yeah, I think that worked pretty well. Yep. Okay, let me.
me just stop the recording. we definitely got a lot of questions.